So let's recap. You received 3 million bucks. Everyone did a bunch of fancy math, and when it's all said and done, you are now the co-founder of a $13 million company. So now you can just sit back and relax. Just kidding. It's about to get a lot crazier. So when we founded Meatly, we started with 10 million total shares, right? And you just added roughly 3 million new shares. Meatly now has roughly 13.2 million total shares. But your investor has one little concern. If you remember, there's this little side pool of 900,000 shares that you reserved but haven't issued. You're saving those shares for future employees, right? That's what we call the option pool. When you gave 100,000 shares to that advisor, that's where those shares came from. But the problem is, your new investors are looking at that bucket of 900,000 shares, and they think it's too small. This is because they've analyzed your whole company. And based on the growth they're expecting from you, they don't think 900,000 shares is going to cover all the employees you need to hire. So as a condition of their investment, they're also requiring that you reserve more common shares for your option pool, which is pretty fair. It makes sense. But here's the question you're going to want to ask. Are you supposed to add more shares into that option pool before the investor gives you the money or after? The answer to that question matters because you guessed it, dilution. Now, in most cases, the investor probably is going to want you to increase the size of your option pool before they give you any money. This is because when you increase the amount of shares, you're going to dilute all current shareholders. And your investor wants this dilution to happen before they become a shareholder. In other words, they want the option pool to dilute you, not them. This is a common term that shows up pretty often in term sheets, and so many founders don't even realize they're being exposed to it. But that being said, these are the terms, and you've decided you're okay with them. So you amend your certificate of incorporation and authorize an additional 500,000 common shares for your employee option pool. All right, some quick math. Before this moment, your option pool was 900,000 shares. You just added 500,000 more. So in total, your option pool is now 1.4 million common shares. You need to make sure that you capture these changes on your cap table in order to keep everyone's ownership percentage up to date. Again, looking at this cap table, we're starting to see life is getting a little complicated. And we're only talking about one new investor. Imagine how nuts it can be when you bring on 15. You increase the option pool, and now everyone, founders and investors, is feeling great. You have 3 million in the bank, and you have enough equity set aside to hire the smartest people in the world. And just for visual clarity, everything in blue is stuff that we haven't updated yet. In a minute, you're going to start seeing how this changes everyone's fully diluted percentage. So that's it. Your Series A is all done. Time to sit back and celebrate, right? No. You remember Carol, your first investor from the beginning? Well, now it's time to convert her $100,000 into preferred shares. So the big question is, how many shares does Carol get? Let's do some math. In your funding round, you determined that the Series A preferred shares are worth about 93 cents because that's how much investor number one paid for them. So, okay, Carol gave you $100,000. At 93 cents per share, that must mean she gets a little over 107,000 shares of the company, right? Except no. If you remember, Carol gave you that money on a safe. And the terms of that contract include a $5 million valuation cap and a 20% conversion discount. This is where you work with your lawyers to figure out which term is going to determine her conversion price. In this case, the valuation cap is going to result in a more favorable price for Carol, so that's what she gets to use to convert her money into shares. Now, I'm going to spare you the torture of looking at all the insane math that goes into this. Generally, it takes lawyers hours of time to figure it all out. At the end of the day, here's where it all nets out. Carol is going to receive her shares at 0.4762 cents per share, which is a huge advantage over the other shareholders, who are now looking at a little over 90 cents. So if Carol gave $100,000 at roughly 48 cents per share, at the end of the day, she's going to get 209,995 preferred shares in your company. By the way, one quick thing to note, that 93 cent share price that you worked out for the Series A is the price for preferred shares or investor shares or whatever you want to call them. But that doesn't mean that your common shares are also worth 93 cents. Remember, 
back when you started this thing, you created common shares at a nominal value of like one one hundredth or one one thousandth of a cent. So that's definitely going up. But in order to figure out how much your common shares are worth, you still have to get a 409A valuation done. That's what a 409A is for, figuring out the value of one common share. So this will come in handy in the next lesson, but let's say you get the 409A valuation done and it determines that one common share of Meatly is worth 50 cents. For now, we just file that number away, 50 cents, because it's gonna come back into the picture a little bit later. Okay. So let's take a look at this updated cap table after you get Carol's money converted into equity. See right here how it now shows Carol's equity has been issued? See, you and every other investor, current and future, can now look right at the cap table and see that the safe has been converted and shares have been issued to Carol. Again, this kind of transparency is pretty essential if you're planning to raise more money in the future. Those future investors are going to want to know the status of every share in your company. So you wanna make sure that you have this all updated. 